Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Today we're going to be taking a look at Visions of Arzak. Basically, it's a bunch of uh, A-list artists doing their uh, version of the great Mobius character, uh, Arzak. But first, I want to uh, let everybody know about Cartoonist Kayfabe comic book Christmas in July, and that is an effort Jimmy and I are putting together, and we are requiring all of your services to go to your free local lending library in your neighborhood and surrounding towns, and uh, fill those fill those boxes up with uh, with comic books. Creators, makers out there, if you got comp copies from your publisher, or you have uh, some stragglers laying around, stuff the mailboxes with those, but also, we all have doubles laying around, and put those in the... Uh, the, the, the little lending libraries. And heck, if you're ambitious, go grab a copy of Watchmen or something. Put put that sucker in there. Let's create that new generation of comic book readers. There will be more videos forthcoming uh, about this uh, this fun event that we're, we're putting together. And uh, Jimmy recently created this little thing that uh, is going to be an added piece where... Uh, explain it, Jim. Yeah, list some stuff. If, if these people like the comic books that they pull out of their lending library... Do a printout or a photocopy that lets them know where they can find more comics. We have a really good library system here in Pittsburgh. I often get graphic novels out of there, so I listed that, along with a bunch of the comic shops in our town. And, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt if they want to hear more about comics. Check out Cartoonist Kayfabe, but it doesn't have to be anything elaborate. You know, if you've got one shop in town, just put a little note in each uh, each comic book so it's easy for them to find more comics. Super smart. I want to also invite you guys to like, follow, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit that bell so that we can notify you when new vids are available. And uh, that helps mitigate that kayfabe effect, which is what happens whenever we talk about a comic and uh, put our videos out in the morning. Those comics disappear often uh, by early afternoon, midday, off the uh, aftermarkets of Amazon and eBay. The earliest the subscribers get the first shot at the things that we, we chat about. And if you watch these videos to the end, that pushes the video content out to other audience members who aren't necessarily uh, familiar with Cartoonist Cape Fave videos, but they are familiar with YouTube. So that helps us increase the subscriber base, which is how we're able to uh, keep these daily vids going. Uh, without further ado, Visions of Arzak. Man, this was sent to us by the, the, the Kayfabe audience, man. Ask not what Cartoonist Kayfabe can do for you. Ask what you could do for Cartoonist Kayfabe. And uh, the bar was set real high with Scott Strong's uh, Gore Blimey Press, Barry Windsor Smith stuff. And we began some legendary shit sent our way, Jimmy. Yeah, this is a fun one. I'm looking forward to going through it. And wow, <laughs> talk about end pages delivering. This is uh, that, that's how you start a book. This is the cover for Heavy Metal. That one of those Long Tomorrow, I think uh, part number two had the spread cover, I think, right? Yeah, that sounds right. It's hard to believe because, like, wouldn't Arzak be on like where the cover, like where it says heavy metal? I forget how that shakes out. Yeah, I wonder if it was if this is a flipped image. That's you know, that's it. That's Either way, it. really nice reproduction. You know, you see this stuff in print, and you always wonder like, what's what's the color look like? Is it printed faithfully? This looks phenomenal. So this is what all the contributors have to stand up to. <laughs> you got to stack up to this, and uh, they do to varying degrees. Ready to jump? Yeah, here's your list of contributors, and quite a list. Yeah. I mean, man. We'll uh, we'll zero in on the microscopic level as we go here. Okay, how about a more modern-day Mobius piece with a speckled airbrush? You know, it's worth, you know, take a mental picture of this and see how different your 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 reproductions can be. Even right. just from the cover to this, like, there's a lot of variation. And, and like, the leg color is very different. So when we talk about reproduction, that's some of the stuff we're looking at. And uh, the, the piece that stands out here to me, though, is observation of being able to draw color and shadow. Right. Beset. Man, seeing all these makes me wonder how everybody's working in color. Yeah. It's probably a lot of media in, on these pages. Yeah. It's like, Beset comes from, you know, the Kubert school. And Joe Kubert can stretch those fucking Doc Martin dyes like you would never believe. So I'm wondering if that's what, uh, that's what Beset is using here. And the thing is, like... Doc Martin dyes are dyes, but there's a way to use them like watercolor, but it doesn't apply like what well. it's very hard to explain if you, you got to play, you know, play with both materials and you'll see the difference. Uh, but there's a brightness to Doc Martin dyes that you do not get with, with watercolor. I think you see some of it, like some of the yellows yeah. are really uh, the very saturated. Too. Yeah. Um, I love the page layout and I love his attention to lighting. Yes. You know, like that, 
shadow under the wing is so believable there. Yeah. And and the little application of white on the scales and stuff that that really that really sings. Mark Baudet carrying on on the legacy, and he's doing that really cool thing of like depth of field with like black line on your foreground elements, going with like a sepia line mm -hmm. on uh, the background characters, but then kind of no holding lines or just uh, I yeah, don't like know co co color color pencil lines with the with the background guys. When you're shooting from an actual image like you could play that game Balland. oh man wow that is a strange image yeah it's, even from like two feet away elements are so photorealistic yeah really like the color treatment on there you know presumably before he goes digital i feel like that's probably five six years later in the later later 90s so whatever he's working media wise i really like how that looks and how observed is the blue paint like they've partially repainted this building yellow yeah but i uh, didn't get all of it yeah maybe so ran nice. out of paint before it was done dude it, this is the arrow when when he showed us those tank girl covers in the shoot interview yeah jeez. bray fogel with some color you don't, it's awesome to see bray fogel in anything you don't often think about him in color no, although he fought with Eclipse towards uh, towards the end of Eclipse yep. over one of the books that was supposed to be color and then printed black and white. Imagine that shocker showing up. Yeah. Same deal with Brunner. You know, I think about Doctor Strange drawings. Yeah, I'm surprised to see that. I'm not familiar with his painted work. It looks good. It looks like a real solid fantasy paperback book cover type style. Yeah, guys are putting a lot of work in on this. Busema's doing some interesting stuff. It, Busemis looks like, hmm, it looks like uh, the European, I mean, the uh, Filipino vibe with some of the marks. You know, it's a different kind of Busema. It's also him inking himself. Or penciling. A lot of it's not inked. Yeah. A lot of that is pencil marks that you're seeing. Yeah. And then like, this uh, might I be, guess, a watercolor. Yeah, this might be a very dark pencil. That's a Butch Arzak, man. <laughs> He's real tough looking and, and bulky. Yeah, that's awesome. It's cool, very, cool it's to very, get a Busima on a on a, a Mobius homage. It's 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 Tolkien. It is. It reminds me he did that um oh the name's gonna escape me, but like a three part fantasy piece. And uh yeah, I think I think he liked the fantasy work for sure. Chadwick, the concrete guy. Yeah, repaying the favor for running that Mobius wordless strip in his uh concrete Earth Day special. Looks like some airbrush on there color pencil like all kinds of stuff man he's going to the drew struzan route you know i like that Bob piece Peak. too it's wild to me how many of these pieces look atypical for the artists they, everybody's stretching themselves they they want to they want to show up for mobius and they know i, I i'm is this kitchen sink man yeah like like dennis kitchen he's he's gaming these dudes and he's like Yo, listen katsuhiro otomo's doing a page so yeah. so you know what i mean so like you well, better it works that's a nice paul chadwick piece yeah and i don't i'm not familiar with tim conrad mm -mm. but uh, i like that piece a lot yeah it's another one great color corbin nice wonder if uh corbin and mobius must have had some relationship right yeah because because corbin would be published in metal or don't right It looks computerish, like like there's, you know what I mean? Like there's just he's he's alchemical, man. I never know what I'm looking at with his work. Yeah, 1991, so it's so modern. The best way to support cartoonist kayfabe is to buy the comics that Ed Piscor and I make. Red Room Trigger Warnings One through Four is in stores now while supplies last. Every Red Room comic is self-contained story, so whatever issue your comic shop has is a great place to start. There's also Red Room, the Antisocial Network, collecting the first season of Red Room, available now wherever comics are bought and sold, except for 28 countries where it is banned and about 10 comic shops where it's banned, but you can still request it, they can still get it for you, and you can pick up Hulk Grand Design by me, two double-sized issues retelling the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk in one coherent story, featuring my art, writing, color, letters, uh, the Grand Design treatment, so to speak. So pick these comics up wherever you buy comics and support Cartoonist Kayfabe. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. Eastman. That feels like a, a meeting of um, many worlds because heavy metal was certainly an influence. Uh, you see some of the other people in here like Corbin, Bode. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the timeline for when Eastman buys heavy metal. Yeah. 
But uh, yeah, definitely, I'm sure he was thrilled to be in this book and part of this group. Yeah, I mean, it's Kitchen Sink, but it's like post-Tundra Kitchen Sink, so he's part of it. Right. No, no, no matter what. Will Eisner always goes into business for himself. <laughs> Whenever like you see his name in like Superman 400 or something, it's going to be Superman with the spirit. Smart businessman. Yeah, but that really looks like Will Eisner in our Zach cosplay. I'm impressed by like some of these faces that these guys are coloring, and I'm not used to their color. Looks really good. I'm glad to see Eisner in this. You know, and obviously close, you know, to Dennis Kitchen makes yeah. sense, but it's it's fun to see it. Jim Fitzpatrick, not don't know much about his work. I like that page. I like these kind of design elements around the page. I bet we see this guy show up in heavy metal. Yeah. Kelly Freeze, longtime Mad Magazine cover painter. Some of the most iconic Alfred E. Newmans. Had to be pretty old around this point. Yeah, it's a good piece too. All of these are good. I'm so impressed by this. Sometimes it's, you get a really... Uh, I've seen these kinds of tribute books go poorly. Yeah, it's fun to see what the people lean on when uh, when they look at their their Arzacs. Or when they do their Arzac. Because like, the hatching egg is a motif. Mm -hmm. I... I did we miss the Sergio Aragones? Oh, yeah, we yeah, did. Yeah, because like, that's like one of his motifs. And he does a comic. Nice. And Jerry Bingham. Yeah, okay. Gibbons. I would not have picked that out as Gibbons. No, not at all. Not at Interesting. all. Interesting. We've seen such little of his color in this way. The only stuff that I can think of would be like in Give Me Liberty, there would be like weird magazine covers that would be painted and and uh, other little dips and dabs there, here and there. But uh, this is really strong. This is like another thing that we've seen, like in the Paul Chadwick. Yeah, the, it's been the, a couple of them. And it's from uh, the, the second Arzak story, like from Heavy Metal Issue 2. Really like that painting by Scott Hampton. I often will see like a Hampton piece in comics, you know, maybe going through a dollar bin or something, and it, it's always good. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Jaime, Jaime had <laughs> Jaime had a real Mobius period very early on, where you could see like marks and some things, even in issue one. Uh, part of the rockets, part of Love and Rockets, I felt like is like a Mobius thing, and and this is like super whimsical because it's like, it's like uh, Marx Brothers homage. Is that what that is? I don't know if that's what it is, but I mean, there's that famous mirror scene that those guys do. Um, I love it. I love the simplicity, and it kind of goes away from the fantasy that we're seeing in a lot of these pieces. And uh, it feels like Jaime. Yeah. But also very, uh, you know, it's playful. I like the signature being reflected. That's a, that's a nice touch. Kelly Jones. Man, the only Kelly Jones part that I would be able to pick out would be like the cloak right there and maybe some of this. Yeah. I like that treatment, too. I like the way he's painting the water. Yeah. I wonder if that's another set of dyes. He's been uh, a really fun follow. I think it's on Twitter where he's posting tons of his original art. It's so good looking. Kaluta. Makes total sense. Cam Kennedy, man. 2000 AD. I believe uh, Star Wars Dark Empire. Man, that Kaluta piece is wild. Yeah. At first, I was like, how do you orient it? But now I get it. Qbert. Heavy hitters, man. They're, they're bringing the A-listers out. That's around that tour um, epic You're time right. period. Yeah, yeah, the color and stuff. Yeah, that's an interesting thing about Joe Qbert is he would, he would play with different media like throughout his career. Like the last era tour would be on like gray Canson paper with black and white color pencil. Yeah, I remember that. Do you think that that's uh, the dyes? I do. Those, those Doc Martin dyes? A, a thousand percent. That's what he, that's how he would color that shit for sure. And doing the smoke stuff, like I seen him do it. And then like guys like Alex Stevens, like mm -hmm. I seen them do that stuff. Pretty good. Yeah. Ted McKeever. I, I loved McKeever around this time period. I went through a McKeever period for about a decade. Sure. Uh, cool to see him included and his art changes a lot too like you'll see different eras of his art this feels so much like that 90s vertigo and he did like three elseworld dc books around that time and it feels like this is of that period angus mckee this would be the the computer whiz yeah that helped uh 
inspire Dave Gibbons to get a computer. Yep. And and you know Dave Gibbons draws completely digitally now. Uh, so based on this guy's inspiration, didn't know that that uh, McKee was like an artist himself. Oh yeah, he's got um. Oh man, he's got a two issue thing. It's the blue. Can't remember the name of it. It's one of those like '90s, like you'd find it in a dollar bin. That's where I found it. But it's uh, him doing, you know, complete comic himself. Couple issues of it, I believe, have been published. Uh, I like that piece though. I like the color treatment. And the foreground backgrounds are really strong. How about that rubber blanket era Mazzucchelli, dude? How about that? That's some different stuff. That's a neat piece to see. Playing with real color theory. That's a. Uh, it's a relatively short time period, I think, in Mazzucchelli. Yeah, that he'd be working this with work that looks like this. Yeah, and, and you know it's the rubber blanket era, no doubt. Dude, this Mignola piece feels like those Kirby, uh, Doc, Doc Martin die paintings that he would do. It does. Where it would have blacks and like using every color available. It also feels like that very first era of Hellboy. Like yeah. you see the reprints of like the San Diego Comic Con program with the first Hellboy in it and stuff. Yeah, it's, it feels like right around that time period. Always a master of composition. Yeah, no doubt. Always bringing the statue in. A lot yeah. of Mignola isms on that piece. Yeah, it just like and and this stuff is not put there for no reason. Like it's a total frame around our center guy. You know, like these are all directional devices. Yeah, very masterful. Unbelievable. Miyazaki, Studio Ghibli, draws some stuff. That goes to show you how wide reaching Mobius is. And then, like, I'm looking at the Ma Nausicaa two, two volume set right in front of me on the on the bookshelf, which is something that we're going to have to put under the microscope at some point. You know, probably a thousand pages worth of comics. Yeah, and it makes total sense that there would be some uh, respect there between these two creators. Or at least from Miyazaki. Dean Motter. Mr. X is uh, predominantly what I know him for. But I also know, like, he comes from illustration. So in a lot of ways, and this is... I, this feels like almost like mocked up, like a mock up illustration. Yeah, it has that quality. Especially there's like a like a scribble through there. Yeah, I don't understand that. Different. John, John J. Muth. I like that treatment too. Is that a kayfabe uh, frame you think on here with with the Arzac underneath it? I don't know. It might be photographed, man. I yeah. don't know. I was I I read recently, and I don't know if this is urban legend, uh, but when you see a mounted like military statue the horse legs mean different things like if the horse legs i don't remember exactly off the top of the head but like if all horse legs are on the ground it means like maybe he died in battle or died of natural causes if the legs are up in the air it means that he died in battle like something like that huh yeah that's a wild piece it's yeah it, it's like you know, Napoleon, you know, has nothing to do with comics. It's all like, it's like classicism, like classical painting in the classicist tradition. It really stands out in yeah. this book. I always think of that whenever you're doing these collections. Like, how do you stand out whenever you're next to like 25 great artists? What do you do different, you know, to make your piece pop? That piece pops. Yeah, it does. Kevin O'Neill. That's a cool name to be in here. <laughs> And see some of the stuff that he's placing important, uh -huh. so that he remembers is the cool framing and the hand letter titles. I like his stuff that he colors himself too. Yeah, I think some of the martial law stuff he colors himself. It's uh, it's such a small group of artists that color themselves, and always surprises me by that. Here's the Otomo piece. Yes, that's a pretty thoughtful piece. Yeah, it is, Fid. There's a lot going on here. And I just, man, his color, like, what the hell does he use? Some of my favorite stuff in, in paintings, certainly in, like, poppy comic book type color, is when you have that white highlight. Yes. Uh, that really, that's like a magical it's, piece. It's a secret. It's yeah. a secret piece to, like, kind of give that depth, make it pop. Yeah. Wendy Peeney. That's a good name to include. She uses a pretty deadline. 
You know, like the one bold stroke for 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 everything. I missed Pop for a set of uh, Elf Quest, like the first batch of issues I saw bundled at Heroes. Yeah. The magazine size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pluke. He's another guy that I just associate with pen and ink. But then he'll go to Bakshi and do a lot of like really cool. Like if you go on Ralph Bakshi's Instagram, you could see a lot of cool Mike Plug conceptual. I think of Plug with some of these like flesh tones that you see around like the muzzle mm -hmm. of that dragon. That that makes me think of uh, of Plug. George Pratt. Nice. I always want to look at his Enemy Ace War Idol graphic novel. Wild strokes here. Yeah, definitely. Denny Rodier. Rodier. Yeah. Probably. Who I remember from fucking Wonder Woman comics. And they were very rough. Yeah. Like, this is pretty exceptional. That's a bit of a different style, too, for this book. That piece stands out. Yeah, it does. P. Craig Russell. Trying to capture that depth. Mm -hmm. Like, that's one of the things. You know, it's, it's basically the cover. Or the uh, end papers. Yeah, real similar. And, and playing with the logo. You yeah. know, a piece I always think of with those heavy metal stories. And I feel like these come from the Inkle. Yeah, I could see that. Sakai. <laughs> Man, you think of like who you're going to put in this in the early 90s. Dennis Kitchen made a lot of good choices. He did. He did. You notice there's not one image guy, man, because they were probably like, M who? <laughs> What's that? Morbius? The Batman vi I mean, the, the Spider-Man villain? And Todd will be like, oh, yeah, I drew, I already drew Morbius in, in Spider-Man. <laughs> I, I colored it, too. <laughs> Shanower, that makes sense. He he did um, Elsewhere prints for Epic that I think was associated with Mobius. Yes. Part of the uh, like the airtight garage world. Yeah, so this, that makes perfect sense that he's he's in here. Nice composition. I love that blue stripe. He's a great artist. He's yeah, a... I, I sat next to him at a Mocha one year early on, and uh, he was delightful to table next to. Yeah, he's one of those dudes that that uh, he's like like sort of like the way that we operate our careers, where he'll do his Fantagraphics bit, he'll do his kitchen sink bit, or slave labor even. Then he'll do he'll do some cups of coffee at Marvel, DC. He was doing, like, at that time period, it would have been early 2000s when Image was probably, you know, not at their best. Mm -hmm. He was doing Age of Bronze, and it was being collected in, like, series of graphic novels, and I think that was a book that was finding its way into libraries, you know, the, the early wave of books, graphic novels going into libraries. Sienkiewicz. Yeah, I was hoping to see a Sienkiewicz in here. That's cool. Shapes. Yeah, it looks like it's on paper. Mm -hmm. That's hard, because, like, you have to mount that. You know, if you're doing it on paper, it's that 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 is going to warp. Yeah, for sure. Simonson doing color. Wow, that's not. I would not have uh, recognized that probably as Simonson. That's that's different. Yeah, it is. I can't even tell what that color media is because, like, this yellow looks like something dry, like a chalk like, or a it, pastel. It, totally. I mean, a lot of it looks it has that quality. Yeah, it does. Uh, like, pastel comes to mind with the teeth. And it's certainly a drawn Simonson signature. Yeah, for sure. The dinosaur seems right on uh, <laughs> on point. Yeah, but, like, I mean, if I just saw this isolated piece, I wouldn't think Arzak at all. That's true. That's Duranko's bright. Mm hmm. I bet that would be a fun one in, in real life, like, after seeing that painting show. Oh, yeah. I really like the background of that. Looks like it's showing up well on screen, too. It's very subtle. You know, he's doing, like, magentas and reds. And then, of course, you push him forward with those greens. Mm -hmm. Be cool to hear what Stranko thinks of Amobius. Yeah. Bill Stout. Another one of those great frames. Love the color there, too. That yellow gold frame next to the purples. Yeah, all that spatter with the airbrush. That's fascinating. Because you got to frisk it that off. You know, there's a process to that. And then you could see a little of the white highlight on the mm -hmm. top piece. You're right about that white highlight. Yeah. Talbot. Talbot's a fascinating artist. He's another guy. You lay out his, samples of his work over the ages. It feels like three or four guys. He, here he's doing a thing that I struggle with. And he he doesn't solve it either. Uh, and, and it feels 
like there's a better way. And you see how they're all evenly spaced and nothing overlapping? Right. Like, if you captured a photograph, it wouldn't look like that. So you have to... Because we're so conscious of tangents and not wanting to do tangents and all that stuff. So, like, how do you solve that? You know, like, this one makes sense. And all you, you just got to extend the thing. But you have to... It's too orderly or something. It's also... Um... I think the color being the same on the ones that are like way in the back and in the front, yeah, is a problem. Yeah, it, it uh, it's counter to like atmospheric perspective. Yeah, it's a it's a super good drawing, but it's just it's just a design compositional thing that I struggle with. Like like there will be you know, pages in X Men where I had to do like carpet bombings, and you draw a bunch of missiles, and it feels wrong to like have the missiles overlap, but like. Uh, I would love to have somebody explain it to me. It's real interesting. I wouldn't have even noticed that if you didn't say it. Now I'm staring at it and I can't tell whether I like it or don't like it. Because it's almost like the American flag. Like it's like evenly kind spaced of. stars. But there's one, I think, like these two overlap. Yeah. And there's a little bit of overlap with this very tiny. But that's figure. it. Yeah. It's hard to draw chaos. And even if they are supposed to be in line, like you still got to overlap it to like really create the depth that mm -hmm. you need. The other move, and I don't know how you do it on this piece, is to have one in the foreground, more in the foreground, where you're getting a wingtip or a foot or something that's, like, really big, but further illustrates that depth uh, illusion. Yeah, maybe even have some of these far ones. Like, maybe have this one cut cut off so that it's behind this thing. Yeah. I don't know. But th but this is, like, one of these compositional struggles that, that I have, and I would love to, to talk to any of our senpais about that because I, I don't know the answer. I can't come up You're with right it You're right about on my the own. chaos thing. Like having, being able to create or illustrate chaos chance, especially because we think about composition. Exactly. And we're doing sketches. Yeah. Like you're not going to get that random tangent without sort of like doing it wrong intentionally. Yeah. Uncle Tim. We got to reach out to him, man. We haven't talked to him in a while. Yeah. I'd like to see how he's doing. That green in, in the middle of that hot is you really look at that it's wild to go from like some of these spreads that have blues and purples and then you you turn the page and it's like all these browns and warms on this spread funny how that how that plays out i always wonder what he uses to color because there will be grain like color pencil it's a good question next time we talk to him yeah bring it up charles vest we saw him running around a hero's con it's wild that these two match up as well yeah. as they do, because they're in alphabetical order. It's not like they arrange these to complement each other. Right. I like that vest piece. This is probably, well, I guess it's a little bit after, like, um, he did that Spider-Man graphic novel. Oh, definitely right? after. Yeah. Reminds me of that. This is great rock. Yeah. Yeah, just, like, sitting in the shade of it. Kent Williams. I love seeing this musculature because you could tell that Kent Williams came from a place of comics, of like superhero comics first, and then went into that direction. Because like, you don't see anybody who just paints nudes and stuff, like has like all these striations and junk like that's That's comic book talk. That's a good piece. I like Kent Williams. He's a guy that would always uh, kind of open my eyes a bit when I'd see a comic thing that he would do. Didn't feel like any of the other comic book artists, which is funny to think like you see here and it's like you can reference the comic book part. But man, when I was seeing him in the context of comic books, it's like, nope, this dude's coming from somewhere else. Oh, definitely. Uh, Gay Hannah Wilson is a surprise in inclusion. It is. Good choice, but definitely a uh, surprise to see him there. It speaks to the wide breadth of Mobius's influence. Yeah, for sure. The glaring omission is Jeff Darrow. Mm-hmm. Like why? Like how is he not here? He was in in the game, and I'm sure fucking Kevin Eastman. He, he, Kevin Eastman likes that kind of artwork. Zach, that's a nice piece. I don't. I you know I would not have picked that as Mike Zach no. without seeing his name there. Really a nice piece. Love it. He's done some very great covers. Oh, mm, well, definitely. Yeah, he's got he's got some iconic ones uh, under his belt for sure. Zuli, I could pick that. I could pick Zuli out of a crowd for sure. It makes sense. That's a nice piece, very different than what we've seen in this rest of this book, but feels like it fits with Arzak and definitely fits with Zuli's style. Yeah, it's it's that exact palette of some of those uh, TMNT covers. 
Yeah, it feels akin of um, what, what was his indie book? The um, Puma Blues. Yeah, feel, feels like that nature and the deer there. No, oh, he's a hippie. <laughs> Notable works from uh, the guys who are included in here. So if you have a if you have a fella, Jerry, so Jerry Bingham, he did Son of the Demon. We see those in the Five Dollar Graphic Novel section. I read that as a kid. That was a graphic, early graphic novel for me. Yeah. Yeah, man. Super nice little product here. Get to show off a bunch of Arzac. Like, we are uh, starved of a lot of Mobius in America, and you can find these books every now and then. Yeah, very it's, cool. It's cool to see the, uh, the nod and homage, man, to... Uh, influential creators and the cool thing was mobius was definitely around to, to see uh everybody spread this kind of love for him which is which is a beautiful thing man it is very nice good to go i am kfabers like follow subscribe to the youtube channel hit the bell we'll notify you when new vids are available what's out there man hulk grand design monster and madness are in comic shops now two double-sized issue telling the 60-year history of the incredible hulk is one cohesive epic that I'm writing, drawing, coloring, lettering in the grand design tradition. You can also join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see more of my original comic art process and download some of my out-of-print zines and mini-comics. Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue 1, 2, 3, and 4 are on the stands as we speak. Red Room, the anti-social network trade paperback, is in stores also. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics. Uh, if your com if Red Room is banned in your comic shop, because it is banned in more than 28 countries and more than 10 comic shops, you got to hit up my link tree in the description below this video. It'll take you to the Fantagraphics website where you can order and pre-order uh, current and future Red Room comics. Also, at my Patreon, you can read the comics serialized there. Three bucks for the archive. More than 200 pages up there as we speak. I put up new strips every Tuesday. I want to call your attention to Car Cartoonist Kayfabe comic book Christmas in July, where we are going to be putting comic books in those freestanding lending libraries in, in our neighborhood and surrounding areas uh, on the very last Saturday of July. Please participate. Uh, share some comics in those lending libraries, and let's spread the word of, for this great medium that we all enjoy. What else do we have out there, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Given those marching orders, Jimmy, we'll be on our way. Make more comics.